Thank you very much for um, inviting me here to Glasgow. This is the first ever President's Lecture to take place in um, Scotland, so truly historic moment. I'm delighted and honoured to introduce our speaker, who is Professor Peter Matheson, who is the Principal and Vice-Chancellor of the University of Edinburgh. He's a renal physician by background, and before coming to Edinburgh, he worked in Hong Kong, Bristol, and Cambridge. His title today is Musings of a Kidney Doctor. I've got no idea what he's going to talk about, but it sounds really interesting, so I'll hand you over to him. And we will have a bit at the end where you can ask questions. Thank you very much, Wendy. Is this, uh, is this working? You can hear me. Yeah, You're a little quiet. Quite. Quite. I was wondering if I might stand up here. Don't um, fall off the back then. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll try to speak up. Can, can people hear if I speak up? Yeah. Um, I'll, if I stand here, this one might be. That one doesn't work. No. It makes a noise like that, but it doesn't make a funny okay. noise. I'll, I'll use this one and I'll try and, I'll try and, uh, I'll try and speak up. Um, so thank you very much for the invitation. And, uh, I'm, I'm looking at my phone, not because I'm doing my email, but because that's where I've made myself a few notes. Um, it's a great privilege to deliver the, the President's Lecture. I didn't realise it was the first one that's ever been given in Scotland. That, that's, um, that's even more of a privilege. So uh, I was thrilled to get the invitation. Um, I, I um, decided what I'd talk about on the basis of really of the invitation that So John Crichton, who wrote to me, um, said that he thought there were three things that I might talk about. He'd heard me give a talk in Edinburgh about some of them. He thought there were three things I might address that might be of interest to you. One was um, student mental health. And I'm going to extend that and talk a little bit about staff as well, because uh, increasingly when I'm thinking about the University of Edinburgh, uh, it seems to me that staff and student issues are inextricably linked. So I'm going to address student mental health, but with some sense about staff as well. Um, one of the things I talked about when John heard me before was talking about some of the aspects that I think need attention at the University of Edinburgh, particularly around student satisfaction. And my belief that um, creating of a sense of community and a sense of belonging uh, it's really important in, in achieving that. aspects of um, the work that my colleagues and I are starting at the University of Edinburgh to try and address issues around student satisfaction and in particular the sense of creating a sense of belonging or a sense of community which um, uh, it is our belief that the, that the university currently lacks. Um, so there'll be something about that. And then the third point that John mentioned was um, uh, aspects of joint working between the NHS and the universities. Um, and I have a bit of relevant experience uh, around that which I'll, which I'll mention. So, so I'm going to try and address those three um, topics. In, in relation to the last one, I'm very conscious that my uh, NHS experience is mostly in England. Um, and uh, the, the, the fact that the NHS in, is different in Scotland is something which has really been impressed upon me a lot by people that I've met since I've been here. So um, I, I will talk about my experience in England um, but I am uh, conscious that it may not all be transferable. Um, and also, the, um, one, one aspect of that is that there's an organisation called Universities Scotland, which is, the, is an organisation of the 19 universities in Scotland. Each of the principals is a member of Universities Scotland. And they have a lead member for health. Uh, and the, that was Pete Dan, who's in Dundee until recently, but Pete's just retired. And I was persuaded to take on that role as lead member for health. Uh, even though I don't really know very much about the NHS in Scotland. And Pete's argument was, well, the best way to find out about it is to take on this role. So, so I, I agreed to do it. Um, and it has helped me because I've managed to get around and talk to quite a lot of people, um, uh, not just in medicine, but also in nursing and the allied health professionals. So, so, so um, I've got a little bit of recent noise, but as I say, I'll, I'll, I'll try and explain the context. So um, I thought I should start with a little bit about me. So as, as you heard from Wendy, I'm a, I'm a kidney doctor, or at least I was once a kidney doctor. Um, I haven't done any active clinical practice for uh, five, just over five years now because I didn't work in, I didn't practice when I lived in Hong Kong, and that's partly because of um, some really, 
restrictive professional uh, registration requirements that Hong Kong now has. Um, and in fact, as a sort of side story, one of the reasons I didn't stay in Hong Kong longer is because my wife, who's an orthodontist, was unable to work in Hong Kong. And so, um, when we originally thought she would be, so that's one of the reasons why we decided to come back. Um, so, what is it about kidney medicine that um, equips me or doesn't equip me to to run a university? And I think I, I, I often get asked, especially by other kidney doctors, why on earth um, do I not do? Because I, I love kidney medicine, and, and I still, if I have any opportunity to do anything, which is usually when I teach or occasionally uh, when I do other things, um, I realise that I miss it. And so, how do how did I? end up doing what I'm doing. Well, um, there are some characteristics, I think, of nephrology which are sort of helpful. When, pe when non-medical people ask me why there are so many medics that now leave universities, I, my, my glib answer is it's because we're trained in giving people bad news. Um, and, and that's kind of helpful. Um, I think it's uh, in, in nephrology. Uh, nephrology is a multidisciplinary team specialty, and that's one of the, one of the reasons I like it. Um, and I think that's kind of helpful when you when you work in a, in a, in a complex, comprehensive university like, like the one that I, that I currently work in. Um, there's a sort of sense of camaraderie among, amongst renal units, which I really used to enjoy. Um, we often felt that we sort of had our backs to the wall and we were looking out to very sick patients, often under very difficult circumstances. Um, I know that renal units are not popular with uh, many other specialist colleagues. There's a feeling that we always very critical of other colleagues, particularly surgeons who often create the renal failure that <laughs> we end up having to treat. Um, uh, and uh, so uh, there, was a, there was a cartoon on the back of Hospital Doctor once which said, there was two doctors talking to each other and they said, you know, it's really important to the morale of a hospital uh, that we've got a renal unit. And the, and the second line was, because it unites everybody in their hatred of the nephrologist. <laughs> I don't know if that's really true, but anyway, there's a bit of a sort of a spirit of, you know, we're up against it and we're all, we're all in it together. So I, I enjoyed that aspect of it. Um, how did I therefore get involved in, in what I like to call leadership, that's really management? Um, well, I made a terrible mistake when I worked in Bristol, uh, which was that I, I criticized some aspects of policy and practice in the department that I was working in. And the, the, um, the boss of the university at that time said, well, if you think you can do a better job, you better take over the, the role of head of the department. Um, which is what I did, and I and I ended, that ended up with it being a bit of a slippery slope. I ended up as the, the dean of the faculty of medicine, and then I ended up doing less and less clinical work, and less and less research and teaching, and then I you sort of committed yourself to that pathway. Um, and I'm only half joking when I call it a mistake. I think it was a mistake. I've enjoyed everything that I've done, and I and I I don't uh, have any regrets about it. And I'm, I, I may well make the same mistake if I if I had my time again. But in terms of leaving my clinical practice behind, I think it was a mistake. My my mother who. Um, who had very strong opinions about everything, um, uh, used to tell me that she thought it was a disgrace that I'd um, wasted all the money that the, that the nation had spent on my medical training, and I was now just what she called a pen pusher. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway. Um, <laughs> so, um, be careful what you, uh, be careful what you criticize, because you might end up being asked to take over. Um, so, um, I, I, um, during my time in Bristol, I did have some interesting uh, experiences relevant to one of the, uh, the, the three topics that I said I was going to talk about, and that's because I became uh, R&D Director for North Bristol Trust, so Research and Development Director. So it had previously always been held by an NHS consultant, and I, I was a university consultant with a half-time contract in the NHS, and I remember saying to Sonia Mills, who was the Chief Executive at North Bristol, um, it, it, she asked me if I'd do this job, and I said, well, if you give me that job, I'll have a conflict of interest. And she said, that's exactly why I want you to do the job, um, because we wanted to sort of bridge the university and the NHS. And so um, I did, that did give me some relevant experience, which I'll come back to. Um, and the other thing that it did for me is it introduced me to NHS management in a way that I never knew about or got involved in when I was a jobbing consultant. I, I, I don't know how many of you are involved in management, but there's a whole jargon associated with it. I used to go to meetings, and they might as well have been talking Swahili. <laughs> um, I could quite often not understand the abbreviations, and I would spend all my time putting my hand up saying, what does that stand for, what does that mean, or who's, who's, who's he talking about? Um, and, and so I suppose it, it, it helped me a bit in terms of understanding some of the stuff about running the NHS, which as a, as a clinician I'd never really, I'd never really got involved with. Um, I became Dean of the Medical School in Bristol in 2008, in the summer of 2008. I became Dean two weeks before the Lehman Brothers collapse. So I thought I would be when I was appointed to the job, I thought I would be building and hiring and, and living in this um, 
uh, luxury of, of resources, and instead of which I spent six years as dean trying to save money um, and trying to deal with the recession. But that was extremely helpful in the relationship that the university built up with the NHS, um, because on the, on the grounds of never waste a good crisis, um, we actually were in a situation where everyone accepted that the old ways of working uh, were not going to be viable, and that we had to do things differently. And Bristol really needed that. Bristol had a fragmented healthcare system with two universities, so the University of Bristol uh, had a medical school, uh, and the University of the West of England provided the training and, and education for the nurses and allied health professionals. And those two universities existed in what was described by the leader of one of them as an atmosphere of mutual disrespect. Um, and that's not particularly helpful. And then the NHS in Bristol was very fragmented. There was a, there was a, um, a separate mental health trust whose, whose geographical patch didn't map onto the city, it was much bigger than the city, and in fact there were two mental health trusts that provided services to the city, and then there were two acute trusts and several primary care trusts and everything. So that fragmentation, which Scotland doesn't have, uh, was a problem when it came to thinking about university and, and NHS joined up working. And so we, we did a piece of work that led to the creation of something called Bristol Health Partners. And Bristol Health Partners is uh, still alive and well. I was the inaugural director of Bristol Health Partners and I spent about two or three years of my life doing this sort of build-up work to uh, create the organisation. And it was based unashamedly on some of the other academic health science partnerships, um, which had become trendy at that time in, in the UK, particularly in England, um, having been popular in America and in uh, Scandinavia for some years before. And this is basically getting universities and NHS trusts, or in, in, in England's case, or NHS or, or healthcare providers in America's case, to uh, work together uh, in a sort of joined up uh, organization. It doesn't sound like rocket science, but it was really quite radical when it started in England. And the, the organization which, I, in my opinion, has got it best, got it right, is UCL. So UCL created something called UCL Partners, and that's gone extraordinarily well. There are a number of other academic health alliances, not all of them have gone quite as well, but Bristol needed some join up because it was a very fragmented system, and again, I'll, I'll come back to the, the relevance of that. Um, then I went to Hong Kong. So I went to Hong Kong to be president of the University of Hong Kong. Hong Kong has eight uh, government-funded universities, but only one of them is English-speaking uh, and comprehensive, and that's the University of Hong Kong. So I, 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 I went from being dean of the medical school in Bristol to, to be president of a, of, a, of a comprehensive university in Hong Kong at quite an interesting time in Hong Kong's history. Um, I'm not going to spend much time talking about Hong Kong, but I'm happy to answer questions about it if people want to ask me. But I'd say um, the, the defining characteristic of working in a university in Hong Kong was the extent of politicization of higher education. And everything in Hong Kong is politicized. And the example I like to give people is baby milk. So baby milk is politicized in Hong Kong in the sense that uh, mothers from uh, mainland China who don't trust the manufacturing processes that leads to the production of powdered baby milk in mainland China tend to come to Hong Kong to buy their baby milk. And you'd think that might be quite a good trade for Hong Kong, and I could never really understand why it was a problem. But it was politicized in the sense that people accused these mothers of coming from mainland China and starving the Hong Kong children by stealing their baby milk, such that the government had to introduce a ration on the amount of baby milk that any one person was allowed to buy on any one day. And it's all about politics, it's all about the relationship between Hong Kong and mainland China. It's not actually about baby milk, it's just an example of the kind of politicization which exists. And, and, and education is politicized as well. So um, I used to get a lot of advice, uh, advice in inverted commas, um, about how to run the University of Hong Kong. I used to get advice from uh, taxi drivers, from market <laughs> store holders, um, from people in the street. I was very recognizable because I'm not Chinese and, and most of the population of Hong Kong is Chinese. So. Um, and I got a lot of coverage in the media, most of it bad. Um, and they, so I got recognized, and people used to come and give me advice. But I also used to get a lot of advice from both the Hong Kong government and the Beijing government um, about what I should or shouldn't be doing in the University of Hong Kong. There's a, there's a body called the University Grants Committee, UGC, which is a bit like HEFTI that used to exist in England uh, as the Higher Education Funding Council. It's supposed to be the body, the umbrella body that sits between government and universities. And when I was going there, everyone said to me, oh, you don't have to worry about the government because the UGC deals with the government. You'll just have to deal with the UGC. Well, nothing could have been further from the truth. Um, the UGC deals with all the, pros, all the prosaic stuff when everything's going well. As soon as things get difficult or, or controversial, uh, the government is on the phone. So, so um, uh, it's a very politicized system 
And again, I think the relevance of that to, to today's topic is I think that's happening in the UK. I think higher education in the UK is becoming politicized. The next uh, general election in the UK, whenever that is, I haven't looked at my phone recently, it could be tomorrow. <laughs> um, uh, so I'll still, still, we still have a government. <laughs> um, but with the next general election campaign, higher education will be an issue in a way that's not usually been in uh, election campaigns in, in my lifetime. And the main reason is that one of the parties, the, the Labour Party, have made a pledge to abolish tuition fees. And so the Conservatives, if they want to get re-elected, uh, have to have some way of countering that pledge, because that's a very populist policy. I don't think we've had details about how it would be paid for, but uh, it, 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 it's, a possible, it's a policy which seems to be likely to be advocated, if not an abolition of tuition fees, and certainly a reduction of tuition fees uh, as part of the next general election campaign. And the university sector is currently holding its breath, waiting for the production of a report by a, a review body called the Order Review. So this is Philip Order who's led this panel, and they're reviewing tuition fees in England. Um, and they're doing so purely because of the Labour pledge to abolish them. The Conservatives have to have an answer. And you, you might say, well, I'm in Scotland. Why am I worried about it? Well, it has major implications for universities in Scotland. We get 20% of our students from England, um, and also, Policies that should get in, employed in funding of higher education in, in England are often uh, followed by similar policies in the devolved nations. So, so it's absolutely uh, affecting us as well, and we're very concerned about it, and we're waiting for the outcome of that report, and I'm sure you've read there have been lots of leaks about it. Um, so uh, that's my introduction. In, in, the, in, in Hong Kong was when I first really became concerned about and having responsibility for student mental health. Um, previously, when I was dean of the medical school in Bristol, um, there were concerns about, about mental health, but it was not a very active uh, issue. And we didn't have um, uh, the unfortunate uh, record that Bristol's acquired actually in the last few years of being one of the universities where student suicides have been apparently higher than the, the population average. And you know, you're, 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 you'll have expertise in suicide, which I, which I don't, but you'll know that there is a significant population incidence of suicide in the age group that goes to university as students. And so you would expect that to continue when they're university students. But so what, what universities do is they look at their, their suicide uh, incidence uh, compared to the general population. And in many universities, it's higher than the general population of Bristol's one. So um, when I was responsible for the 28,000 students of the University of Hong Kong, I felt that I had a responsibility for their welfare and their welfare included their mental health. And, and this, this first time, actually, in my, soon after I arrived in, in Hong Kong, we had the protests that were called the Occupy protests, where the streets of Hong Kong were barricade, barricaded for 79 days um, in a, in a pro-democracy protest, which, which went on much longer than anyone expected. And the, and the students and staff of the University of Hong Kong were very significant in that protest. And I, um, I, I described at that time what I, my, what I felt as if I had what I called a quasi-parental responsibility. So I felt as if I had 28,000 kids. Because I tried to be, think how I would feel if my own kids were down there protesting. What would I be worried about? What I was basically worried about was their safety. And so um, I spent a, a, quite a lot of effort, both publicly and behind the scenes, trying to help resolve the protests, and I did so because I was motivated by the sense of responsibility for the welfare of my students. And, and so I suppose that then transfers into their welfare more generally when they're not protesting on the streets. Um, and I felt exactly the same about their mental health. I felt as if I got a sort of parental responsibility. So I'm a parent, and many of you will be parents, and you'll know that um, parents never stop worrying about their offspring. Um, and we, my wife and I still talk about our children, even though they're not really children anymore. Uh, and we worry about their mental health. And in the same way, when you're, when you're responsible for a large student body, you feel that sense of, of, uh, of responsibility. Um, there is a high suicide rate in Hong Kong. It has, it's bimodal. There's a high suicide rate in young kids. And in fact, it's actually younger than uh, the UK. There's, there's quite a significant suicide rate in secondary school kids. Um, whereas in, in the UK, as I understand it, the first peak is in a slightly older age group. And then there's a second peak in old age in Hong Kong. And I think those two peaks probably have some Hong Kong specific explanation. So, so um, in the elderly, for example, um, there's no system of health care for the elderly in Hong Kong. There's no social support. Unless you work in the civil service, uh, the police, or the universities, um, there are no pensions. And so people in Hong Kong, one of the reasons that everyone in Hong Kong works 24 hours 
uh, days, seven days a week, is because they're saving up for their old age. Uh, they're saving up for their health care when they're not able to work. Um, and so there are, there's a significant feeling that some elderly people commit suicide because they don't want to be a burden on their, on their, uh, on their children. Um, and they, uh, there's also a sense that, that some of it's due to overcrowding. A lot of people, have, although Hong Kong is thought of as a very wealthy place, and indeed there is a great deal of wealth there, um, there's also a great deal of uh, poverty. And there are a lot of people living in very tiny accommodation, overcrowded accommodation, uh, and, and sometimes elderly people uh, are, are thought to um, wish to solve that problem uh, as one of their motivations for committing suicide. And the commonest method for them to commit suicide is burning charcoal. Um, so they usually don't do it at home because they're a very superstitious race and they, they would, that would be terribly bad luck for the home if somebody dies in it. So they go somewhere else, they usually go to a hotel or somewhere, seal up all the windows and burn charcoal and that's the way they, that's the way they tend to do it. Uh, in the young, the most common method of, uh, of committing suicide is jumping from high buildings. And you'll know that Hong Kong's got a supply of very high buildings, uh, not all of which are properly defended. So um, uh, that's a common method of, of, of suicide. And whilst I was there, there was a worrying uh, in apparent increase in uh, the rates of suicide, in the, particularly in the secondary school groups. There were also suicides in universities, including mine, um, but the, the rates were higher among secondary school kids. And the, um, the Department of Education of the Hong Kong government commissioned a report, including some expertise from the University of Hong Kong and, and some student representations, uh, to look into the reasons for uh, this uh, apparent increase in suicide. And uh, the conclusions of that report uh, famously said that the, that the problem can't be blamed on the education system. Um, and uh, that report was very heavily criticized because there were lots of people that felt that it could be blamed, at least partly, on the education system. And I thought I'd just tell you a little bit why, because again, I think it's relevant to the UK. So um, if I tell you an anecdote, um, I met one of my uh, young assistant professors walking around the campus of the University of Hong Kong one day. She was looking a bit downcast, and I stopped and talked to her and said, hey, "What's up?" And she said, oh, "I'm just I'm worried about my daughter." Um, she said she's just had her ninth interview for kindergarten. Um, and I said, "Can I just have that sentence again, please?" Uh, interview kindergarten. Didn't realise that those things went together. This daughter was two and a half, um, and she'd had nine interviews. And I said, well, what's the problem? Why is she not getting in? And she said, well, two of her languages are pretty good, but the third one's not much good. Um, so this child could speak English and Mandarin to the standard that was expected for a two and a half year old, but her can this is an American mother, the Cantonese was not quite up to scratch. Um, there is this extraordinary pressure on Chinese kids, actually all over China, but particularly in Hong Kong, to achieve. And the entry into kindergarten is really, really significant because if, once you get into a good kindergarten, there tends to be a through train in, into the related primary school and into the related secondary school. And so the pressure rises on, uh, arises on two and three year olds in a way which I think is completely extraordinary. And so that's, uh, that's one example of the uh, educational pressure that kids in Hong Kong are under. And that's not necessarily the, the school's problem, the pressure is parental or societal pressure, but it's a very significant phenomenon. Hong Kong's a very high achieving school society, so if just one yardstick is, is IB, so a lot of the international schools do IB, the International Baccalaureate, as their, as their university qualifying exam. They don't do A-levels anymore, a few do. Um, and most, most Hong Kong schools do a separate qualification called the Hong Kong DSE, the Diploma of Secondary Education, but um, a lot of kids do IB. And, and worldwide, I've got the figures here, worldwide, 0.3% um, um, uh, of people doing IB uh, get 45 out of 45. So the maximum mark you can get is 45. Worldwide, 0.3% of kids get 45. In Hong Kong, 1.7%, six-fold higher of kids doing IB get, get top score. And the average score in IB is about 36, which is six points higher than the global average in IB. So this is a very high achieving educational system, but part of the way it achieves it is through intense pressure on the kids, intense pressure to achieve intense parental expectations. And we often heard kids complaining that you know, on, on, at the weekend they didn't have to go to school, but they were doing either extra tuition or they were doing music or they were doing something else in order to boost their, their CV and their chances of getting into uh, one of the top universities. So um, there's a real system of pressure uh, in, in Hong Kong. And I think the education system is at least partly responsible for the pressures that are on these kids and the consequence for their mental health. So what can we do about it? So in, in Hong Kong, one of the things I learned is that Chinese attitudes 
uh, included an attitude that it was a sign of weakness to ask for help. Um, and that's something which I learned to try and address in my populations. And again, I think it's relevant to my job now. Um, the, the message that it's, it's a sign of weakness to ask for help is something that we have to reiterate a lot. It's not. It's a sign of strength to ask for help. And we have to constantly try and re-emphasize that. And of course, we then have to provide the help. And um, in the University of Edinburgh, we are putting ever-increasing resources into counselling services, uh, into other things, for mental health things. There's a thing called the Big White Wall, which many of you will know about, which is a commercial product um, which we subscribe to, where people can seek help and seek support. I don't think we should be, be, be being the NHS to our population of students. Obviously, the NHS provides services in Edinburgh, and they, our students are as eligible for those services as any other citizen of Edinburgh. But there's no doubt that students and indeed staff look to the university for the provision of all sorts of support, and mental health support is, is one aspect of it. So it's an obligation for us to provide it. We're doing our best to provide it as well as, as we can. For counselling, we have uh, waiting lists, but 99% of <coughs> students referred for counselling get an appointment within three weeks. Now, three weeks is not quick enough. It, it's an emergency, and we have other systems to deal with emergency situations, but um, we do think we're providing a reasonable service, but it's not, it's not enough, and the students constantly ask us for, for more. So um, student mental health is a huge issue. Staff mental health, uh, I think we know less about, and obviously the staff of, the, of any university are citizens of wherever they live, and so they'll, be, they'll have access to all the NHS services as well. They don't necessarily come to the university for their, for their health care. I think expectations of the staff are not as uh, high in terms of what the university will provide. People keep asking me what surprised me about uh, my current job. So I, I was out of the UK for a few years and now I've come back to do a sort of similar job here to the one I was doing in Hong Kong. And people seem to be interested in what surprised me. And if I, had to, I, I would say, I mean, the weather for a start, that surprised me. Um, I had to get a whole new wardrobe after moving from Hong Kong to Edinburgh. Um, uh, and we, we, we didn't have any sort of thick, heavy coat, but now, now we do. Um, but so one of the things that's really surprised me is the extent of nervousness amongst staff. Uh, soon after I arrived here, uh, I arrived in Edinburgh, um, we had the industrial dispute over the USS pensions, um, and that made me uh, uh, made it necessary for me to go out and talk to lots of groups of staff. Uh, I had sort of town hall meetings where I would where I would just invite people to ask me questions and whatnot, um, and consult with lots of groups of staff. And I did it around the pensions. Dispute. Of course, people were very concerned about pensions, and they were very concerned about pay. But there were also extraordinary levels of nervousness about other things. I mean, Brexit is the obvious one, um, but also people worried about the, the sustainability of the higher education sector. You know, am I working in the wrong sector? Are universities going to go out of business because of the rise of online provision of education by other people? Um, and, you know, is the pound going to get weak? Is the UK going to be hostile to immigrants? I've got a third of my staff come from the EU. They're obviously even more worried about Brexit than those of us that are UK citizens. Um, and then I've got about 20% of staff from outside the, the UK history of the EU. So um, the, the idea that these people don't feel welcome or don't feel secure or don't feel that they can necessarily plan to stay is a major source of anxiety. So I was really surprised by the extent of that phenomenon or those related phenomena uh, amongst the staff of the university. Um, so um, a major mission for, for, for me uh, and all my colleagues is to try and support the students as best we can, to try and support the staff as best we can, make all of them feel valued, and also have an environment that we hope will recruit talented people going into the future. That brings me to student satisfaction. So when I read about the University of Edinburgh, and I started to think about uh, whether or not to throw my hat in the ring, um, the thing that you always read when you read about the University of Edinburgh is that there's some problem with student satisfaction. There's the major manifestation of that is a thing called the National Student Survey, so every year, uh, the, uh, the, the, the graduating class of British universities, undergraduates, uh, in their final year, fill out a thing called the NSS, the National Student Survey. And Edinburgh has done poorly in the National Student Survey ever since it was introduced, and continues to do poorly, despite the major efforts made by a lot of people before my time, and made a lot of resources poured into trying to address the problem. And so that it's really interesting to understand why that is, and uh, what can we do about it. There's a sense in which it's, some people say it doesn't really matter. Personally, I believe it does matter because I believe 
we should be doing everything we can to provide as good a deal as we can to our students. But there is a you know, great sense of community, and it's actually rather difficult to put into practice. But we've got lots of theories, and again, I'm happy to talk in more detail about, about how we might do that. So um, why uh, do, do I think student satisfaction in Edinburgh is poor? It's not because we don't have talented staff or we don't care about the students. It's absolutely not that. Um, it's not because people haven't made efforts to try and address some of the points raised from the National Student Survey and various other yardsticks of, of student satisfaction. I think this is a parallel with Bristol. When I worked in Bristol, uh, student satisfaction at the University of Bristol was poor as well, particularly in the medical school, which, which I became dean of. Um, and I, I spent a lot of time talking to students to try and understand this. Um, and I felt that the students, uh, and again, Bristol's very heavily oversubscribed. Bristol gets more applications per place to study medicine uh, than any other uh, UK university. So it's a very heavily oversubscribed medical school, and yet student satisfaction is poor. Um, and I felt that the students credited the city for all the things that they enjoyed. They loved living in Bristol. Bristol's a great place to live, same way as Edinburgh's a great place to live. They credit all the good things to the city, and they credit all the bad things to the university. So if, the, you know, if your Wi-Fi doesn't work properly, or you don't get your assignment back in time, or your teacher doesn't show up on time, um, that's all black marks against the university. So there's no balance between the sort of the good things about being a student in Bristol and the bad things. Whereas in somewhere like, um, like for example, St Andrews, which many of you will know, the, the identity that you have in the University of St Andrews is really powerful. It's a small university, it's in a small city or small town, but there's nothing, when you go to St Andrews, almost everything you see is either the university or the golf course. That's, it, that's about it. <laughs> um, and so um, you, you know what you belong to, you know, and it's a relatively small, compact organisation. So this sense of, uh, of community, I think, is very much stronger. And the, the challenge to us is to recreate that in Edinburgh. And I don't think it's impossible, but it's certainly not straightforward, and we're going to have to put resources into it. So the um, third topic then that I promised to talk about, um, uh, and I've probably got about 10 minutes left, is that right, Council? So um, there's, there's some aspect of NHS University working out already referred to my experience in Bristol, Bristol Health Partners. Um, I would say that another thing that surprised me in the time since I've been in, uh, in my current job um, is that I've never been as conscious of the differences between different parts of the UK as I have since I've lived in Scotland. I, I, I'm genetically Scottish, my father was born in Edinburgh, but as you can tell from the accent, I've never lived in Scotland. Um, and um, I, I've become very, very conscious that things are just different here. Um, and there's a sense that sometimes decisions that are made in the UK, in, in London or in the UK government uh, don't always take account of, of Scottish uh, interests and Scottish wishes. I find this in the Russell Group. So the University of Edinburgh is a member of the Russell Group. There are 24 members of the Russell Group. This is the group of research intensive universities. Um, there's Edinburgh, Glasgow, uh, Belfast and Cardiff for, from the devolved nations. So there are four of those 24 that are from the devolved nations. And we, the, the principals of those four universities often tend to sit together. Not, Anton must be telling you, but tends to sit in the front because he's the current chairman. But the other three tend to sit together. And, and our hands are always going up from that corner of the table, sort of saying, please remember that you know, there, is, there is somewhere other than England. Um, and so that sort of feeling I've become part of really quite quickly. And when we think about the NHS, I actually think there are some big advantages to being in Scotland compared to being in England. I think the NHS in Scotland is much less fragmented. There's a single board that deals with all aspects of healthcare, including mental health. So there's not separate trusts in the way that there are in England and the way that was so, so problematic for me in Bristol. So in theory, joined up working between the NHS and the universities should be easier in Scotland than it is in England. Um, but there's not much evidence that that actually plays out. So collaboration between the universities uh, in, in Scotland and the, uh, and the government and the, and the uh, NHS uh, are, are complicated. There are some difficult relationships and, and it sometimes feels rather frustrating you don't feel as if we're, we're all on the same side. It's partly numbers, so Scotland has 19 universities, five of those universities have medical schools and 11 of those universities offer a total of 40 degrees that include some aspect of nursing. But the pro and there's various programs of our health professionals as well. And the programs are very, very heterogeneous, very varied in size. Take nursing as an example, the, the nursing program at the University of Edinburgh is tiny. It has about 45 uh, students uh, per year. So it's a very small program. Whereas the programs at Napier and Glasgow Caledonian and, and, and some of the others Sterling are enormous. And so you can't treat a tiny medical school, a tiny nursing school in a big university the same way as you can uh, a big university, a, a, big, a big school in a small university. So, the government tends to think, tend, the government tends to want to be fair 
and it tends to distribute money in a fair, sort of uh, equitable slice of the cake way. Whereas actually, these programs are really very different. The program, the nursing program in, in Edinburgh is very academically focused, very much more focused on research, and maybe more inclined to produce nurses that will go into academic careers, uh, rather than, than being more practical or, or, or practitioner focused, which Queen Margaret or one of the others might be, might be have as their ethos. So I think there's an issue there about the heterogeneity. That's sometimes one reason why uh, the working with the NHS is not uh, smooth. I think the other reason is that the universities don't <coughs> tend to speak with one voice. We tend to compete. And I think 19 universities competing in a population of 5 million uh, is, creates problems. And so therefore, there is this organization called University of Scotland. I refer to it because I'm their, I'm their, their lead member for health. Um, I think University of Scotland needs to speak for the universities in a, in a better way than it currently does. But in order to do that, the universities have to behave. And universities don't always behave. Universities are very autonomous organizations. Everyone has their, their own opinions about how to do things. And so we, I think we're our own worst enemies sometimes in getting joined up policy. We, we have many, many shared interests with the NHS, particularly around people. So recruitment of staff to Scotland is problematic, and particular parts of Scotland in particular, and you'll know more about this than me, but I gather that Grampian is a particular problem in terms of uh, vacancies, both for medical and nursing uh, positions. So, and then there's the remote and rural parts of Scotland which are difficult to recruit to. So we have some geographical uh, issues around recruitment and retention of staff, and this is a problem for the NHS and a problem for the university. So why don't we address the problem together and work together, and increasingly we're, we're trying to. The government wants us to get more males into nursing and allied health, profession, allied health professions. They want us to improve the retention on nursing programs um, because there's a, there's a high dropout rate. Um, and and they, they have something called outcome agreements. So the Scottish government, together with the NHS, creates something called an outcome agreement. And they send these to universities like mine. And they say, this is what we expect. We, and they're, they're currently expecting us to increase the number of males, the proportion of males on nursing programs and they're expecting us to improve retention. We don't really know uh, how they expect us to do it. They're not giving us any additional money to do it. They're just saying, this is what we expect. We also don't know the consequences of not doing what they expect. <laughs> it's gonna be kind of interesting to find out. Um, but there is this sort of slightly confrontational attitude between the NHS as a, in, in terms of funding, in particular around people, uh, and, uh, and the universities. And I think it's extremely unhelpful. Um, to tell you a little bit about structures, so I've talked about University of Scotland, um, there are 19 universities, Edinburgh and Glasgow together account for 50% of the sector. So the other 17 account for the other 50%. So Edinburgh, I mean Edinburgh is by far the biggest, um, uh, it's bigger than Glasgow, Edinburgh and Glasgow together account for 50%. So um, if Edinburgh and Glasgow can collaborate on things, that's a good start in terms of getting the university sector to speak to one voice. And soon after I was appointed to this job, I sat next to Anton Muscatelli, uh, who's the, the principal of the University of Glasgow, at a meeting in Singapore, and I said to him, um, what do you think about putting hundreds of years of mutual hostility behind us and having a bit of alignment between the University of Edinburgh and the University of Glasgow? And if I'm honest, I had in mind Brexit particularly. I was thinking that the implications of Brexit would be very similar for the two universities, and we might as well join up our thinking about it. But in fact, we're now doing joint PhD schemes and we're doing some work together on widening participation. So I'm quite keen on that collaboration, and I think it's helpful for Scotland if two of these universities can work together. Um, then there's a thing called the Board for Academic Medicine, which is chaired by somebody called Peter Riven. You'll notice Peter Riven used to be Dean of the Medical School in um, Nottingham, and then used to be, um, uh, I'm not sure what his title was, President or Chair or something of the GFC. Um, and he, uh, he's now Chair of this Board for Academic Medicine. I've known Peter for donkey's years, because we were, we were Deans together, and that's quite helpful, because I, I can speak through him to the five medical schools and to the government. So that's helping. And then there's an organization called the Council of Deans for Health, uh, which uh, is the leadership of the nursing and allied health professionals. And again, they've been very welcoming and, uh, and, help, and helpful in my efforts to try and join things up. So there's a bit of a theme here, I think. I, mean, I found when I worked in Bristol that things were much better if we collaborated with one another. We spoke with one voice, and I think we achieved that. Bristol's a much better place to do health-related research now than it was 10 years ago. Um, and we need to do something similar in, in, in Scotland, and we're, we're working on it. One other example of why the NHS and, and universities need to work together, and this is about research. So if I'm just going to give you one specific example. There's a, there's a diabetologist called Andrew Morris who worked, used to work in Dundee. And Andrew uh, came up with some proposals to um, apply data science to the management of diabetes. 
And this was about identifying patients, trying to identify complications early and trying to intervene early. And he produced a system in Dundee and then in Tayside which led to dramatic reductions in the incidence of blindness and the incidence of amputation as a consequence of diabetes. And um, he then moved to Edinburgh, and as part of his move to Edinburgh, he scaled that project up to cover not just uh, Dundee, but to cover the whole of Scotland, and it had exactly the same results. And he's now working in Shenzhen, in uh, mainland China, where the population of Guangdong province is 108 million. Um, so he's gone from a small population in Dundee to 5 million people in Scotland to 108 million in Guangdong province, scaling up something that seems to be a very good idea. Scotland is the right size for that kind of project. We also have the unique health identifier, which is an extraordinary advantage over England. And we also have a population that seems to be willing to participate in, in experimental medicine procedures. So um, I think Scotland's got a real uh, position in, in terms of clinical research which could improve outcomes. That's just one example, there are many others. And I think we should maximize that, uh, that, that, that opportunity. So um, I'm going to conclude at that point, Carol. So uh, my, uh, my three points are that universities are very concerned about mental health issues, particularly in their students, but also in their staff. We need your help, your professional uh, expertise to help us to address that. I, I, I worry that despite the fact that I've got a medical school in my university, we don't use the medical school enough to study and understand the problem. We've got expertise that should be applied to student mental health, uh, but we need, we need help because we don't know all the answers. Um, on student satisfaction, if it is to improve at the University of Edinburgh and anywhere else, I think this issue of the sense of community and belonging to something is really, really important and we need to work on that and it's challenging. And thirdly, I'd say that universities and the NHS are on the same side and often want the same things, particularly around people, recruitment and retention, but also around improving outcomes with research projects like the diabetes one that I referred to. I think universities need to, to speak with one voice uh, and they often don't. I, I, I've, found in the time that I've been in Scotland a very powerful sense of identity here, a very powerful sense of pride about being in Scotland, pride of our hundreds of years of educational heritage, pride of our healthcare, pride, pride of the fact that it's better than um, the healthcare system in uh, England. Um, and the one criticism is often leveled at Scotland is that health outcomes are poor in Scotland. And so people say, if the healthcare system is so good, why are outcomes poor? If you correct the socioeconomic uh, indices, Actually, the health outcomes in, in England and Scotland are really quite similar, so the difference gets much smaller. But Scotland does have some major challenges in healthcare, uh, and I think the, the extent to which universities and, and NHS providers can work together will help us to address those problems. Um, I'll stop at that point, Carol, and invite any questions. Thank you very much.